Did it? 
people said that's some powerful messages in song I hope you got it I hope you got the message that was great amen appreciate our missionaries you pray for them amen. one thing I love about being independent Baptist by conviction is I believe that's the way you support missionaries you get to know them you love them you get involved you email them you pray for them and they come back and they give account nothing wrong with that say amen Thank God for these missionaries. Well, it's our privilege to have Brother Randy Sutherland. When I started praying, I pray a lot over these August meetings. I really do. This is the 21st year. And um, the first person God laid on my heart was Brother Randy Sutherland. And then I went to a meeting, and he preached a tremendous message on depression. And I wasn't having such a good week. You ever had that, pastors? I mean, you ever had a week where it wasn't such a good week? And boy, it ministered to my heart. I said, we got to have it. And I said it before and I'll say it again. Anybody to follow Brother Sammy Allen has to be either crazy or God called. I believe he's God called. And I know that there's going to be a lot of changes because he's not Sammy Allen. He's going to change things. He's going to be his own self. And I, I admire that out of this man. Amen. But I want you to pray for him. One thing I admire about him last year, last week I was down at the camp several times. Got the, had the honor of preaching down there. And I noticed how he and Brother Stennett respect Dr. Sammy Allen and his leadership on that camp. That touched my heart. I mean, that touched my heart that here's a man of God that's going to be soon the leader that was submitting to the man of God that's carried that mantle for so many years. Brother, you come preach. It's an honor to have you. Make yourself right at home. And I'm just glad we got this many people showed up tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Appreciate you, brother. I'll be here. Well, I'm scared to death. <laughs> I am. I am. I'm telling you, I ain't lying this time. I'm shook up, boy. Amen. But uh, I appreciate the Lord letting me get here. Amen. And uh, I really am. I am nervous and intimidated. And let me give me a drink of this water. Is this all right? Is this mine? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Brother Spangler, you didn't bring us out of one of them hollers over there in Chatsworth, did you? <laughs> God, I'll drink it all. We'll have a meeting one way or the other, praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen, yeah. I go home, my family say, how'd it go? I ain't never had that kind of liberty. I'll tell you what, buddy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I tell you what's a good crowd. I mean, good number. Good number. I don't know how good we are, but good number in here. Amen. Uh, I, I tell you what, I'm, I'm honored to stand where so many, you, you told preacher when you was down there, all the men that preach for you here. And I, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just honored to be here tonight. And uh, it's a privilege to come, try to minister to you and help you. And I want to do that tonight out of the Word of God. Out of Psalm 61. Psalm 61, Psalm 61, there is a <clears throat> large number of people here tonight, large for me anyway, I, I don't know if we, uh, if we got a count of who's here tonight, there's a man down home got a counting bird dog, it's, it's, you ain't never seen a lie, <laughs> really, the dog can count, uh, and a uh, fellow took me hunting one time. Said, uh, said, Brother Randy, said, this dog can count. I was like, you're kidding me. He said, no, he can count. Really? 
And uh, we hunted for about 15 minutes, and the dog, when he went on point, he went like that right there with the front paw, and went like that. He said, there's one bird in there. One. I said, you're crazy. He said, no, I'm just telling you. And sure, sure enough, one bird come flying out. And uh, I said, that's just coincidence. We went on about 15 more minutes, and uh, the dog went on point. When it did, it went like that right there and put two paws and then went on point. He said, there's two in there this time. I said, you're kidding me. Sure enough, boom, boom, two birds come out. Hunted about 10 more minutes, and uh, the dog looked around. I noticed it kind of stopped, and there's a limb laying on the ground about that long. And the dog reached over and put that limb in his mouth and went like that right there. I said, what's that mean? He said, there's more birds in there than you can shake a stick at. Amen. 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 Hey, there's more birds in here than you can shake a stick at, that's what I'm saying. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I know, uh, you know, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And I'm nervous, and so that's kind of how I calm down. Amen. So uh, that, that helped us uh, tonight, I hope. I want to try to be a blessing to help to you. I told the preacher I wished I had his clear-cut direction every time about what to preach as I do tonight. And uh, these fellows, they amaze me. I mean, they just seem like they know every time. And, uh, boy, a lot of times I'm like, Lord, I'm torn here, and I, I want to do this, and I want to do this, and God, just please help me. And, Lord, you're going to have to help me, and God, please bail me out. And if I make a mess, please forgive me. But I, I really feel like the Lord's directed me out of Psalm 61 tonight. Uh, it is thought that this psalm was written during one of the greatest trials of David's life. And you can read about it there in 2 Samuel 16 and 2 Samuel 17. Uh, it was the time of uh, Absalom, David's son. It's time of Absalom's rebellion. And David now is forced to flee for his life uh, because of his own boy wanting to take his life. And leading up to Psalm 61... Uh, David is driven from the house of God. He's gone away from the sanctuary of God. And now he is leaving the land that he loves and having to go out and live in the wilderness. I'm talking about the king who had the palace at one time. And now his favorite son Absalom uh, has turned against him. And now he's dwelling out with his armed men. Uh, and uh, he's out in the open plain. And as he thought about this situation in his life where his son is after him wanting to take his life, He's totally innocent, did nothing wrong. And in Psalm 61, the writers say that that is the background of this psalm. And wave after wave after wave began to come over him because he didn't expect this to happen, didn't see it coming, and now he's on the run. And Psalm 61 in verse 1 said, Hear my cry, O God, and attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. And I want to preach tonight a little bit, and I know I've heard preachers preach on this, but the Lord gave me these thoughts about overcoming an overwhelmed heart. Overcoming an overwhelmed heart. Now, there's a variety of circumstances that will come in our life that can bring us to a place where David finds himself, and that is being overcome by an overwhelmed heart. I'll say this, being overwhelmed is not exclusive. We think that because you're serving God, right with God, everything going good, you back the preacher, you tithe, you give to missions, you're faithful to the house of God, that you're exempt from being overwhelmed. But that's not right. There's going to be times in your life you can serve God, be reading your Bible, be right with God, and then something will come up in your life to overwhelm you. Maybe it's a traumatic event. Sometimes it's a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a severe illness or loss of health or maybe just an inability to pay the bills or some pressure on the job or, or a co-worker or a boss or an issue of life or maybe it's just something that is stronger than you are. And the truth is that these experiences that I just mentioned are just the wears and tears of everyday life and that will affect your heart physically if your heart is unable to to perform the functions and unable to get the blood where they need to go, where it needs to go, it will take away that power that you need to operate. And when the action of the heart is stopped, even temporarily, that will tell on you. And I'll say spiritually, spiritually in your heart, that's your will, that's your drive, that is your want.
want to, that's your well with all, that you get up and go, and that's your stick to itiveness, sometimes that will be overwhelmed by something that happens to you, and that will affect you spiritually when you find yourself overwhelmed. And I'm talking about a gradual closing in. I guess probably the best word picture of this word, overwhelmed, is to be covered up or to be totally smothered. Have you ever been to a place and, uh, you know, it's talking about the linebacker there and, uh, and uh, I like football. I mean, listen, call and say what you want to. I can put on a helmet right now and knock you out, come across the middle and like it. Amen. Uh, but uh, I, I uh, and I'm not boasting this a long time ago, but I, I was good at wrestling. And the reason I was is because I, be, I could not stand to be held down. When they held me down, you mark her down, I'm coming up. It doesn't matter. And I ain't turning loose through a lightning strike. Amen. Y'all country folk know what that means. I couldn't stand to be smothered or to held down. I'm claustrophobic now. I, I get in elevator go up more than two uh, uh, two stories. I'm getting nervous. My wife's looking around. I can't crawl under the house. If there's any kind of problem under there, amen, I ain't going under there. I start smothering and that's, that's kind of where David finds himself. He's covered up. He's smothered. He's overwhelmed. And we find ourselves in these ways sometimes. The cares of this world, uh, troubles or pressures or questions or doubts or fears or just stuff. And things begin to sweep over us and it makes us feel like we're helping Helpless, and it makes us feel like that we're in the spiritual dumpster. And I tell you what, we're missing an element in the house of God, and that's just some old-fashioned honesty. Everybody in here ain't doing good. Everybody in here is not on the mountaintop. And just stop the facade and drop all the act and say, Brother Randy, I'm overwhelmed and I need some help tonight. Thank God that when you are overwhelmed, it has been said this, tribulation will bring us to God and bring God to us. And I'm glad for that. Sometimes we need to realize that we can't even walk without God's help. And so I want to preach on that a little bit tonight on overcoming an overwhelmed heart. First of all, look at the reality of the struggle. He said, hear my cry, O oh God. When you are overwhelmed, there will be an O in your prayer. Uh, it has been said, where did the O go in our prayer? But you find out that there's not going to be many O's in your prayer till you find out that you are overwhelmed. Now we might as well be honest. Here's what we do. Everything's going going good. Everything's fine. I mean, listen, the bills are paid. We've got food. We've got raiment. I mean, listen, every once in a while, I might even be able to go to the Cracker Barrel. May have a little bit of spending money. Might be able to take the children and do some things. Everything's all right then. And our prayer life is about letting no, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I remember, my, this ain't in the message, but I remember my cousin one time. Uh, she asked her mama, said, Mama, who's fashion died? And she said, who are you talking about? Said, fashion die. Every night we pray, fashion die before I wake. Uh, but listen, you know, a lot of times what we do is we give these little old prayers, little old one, two, threes, uh, because things are going good. But you let something in your life overwhelm you. You let something in your life that you did not expect. That's where David finds himself here. And this is real. I mean, listen, David is not just something he's conjured up in his mind. This is a real situation. And I'll say this, a lot of times what might be something something that will overwhelm you may not overwhelm me, uh, but you might be overwhelmed by something that would overwhelm the rest of us. Uh, but listen, God knows what's going on. I don't know what's happening in your heart, and I don't know what's overwhelming you, but this is a real struggle in this life of David. And I thought about this. We need some help. And he cries out. He said, hear my cry. He said, God, I'm going to have to have your help. I'll say this tonight. We need help in our churches. Man, you need help at Whitfield Baptist Church. You say, how do you know that? Because it's a Baptist church, amen. I've been a member of one for 20 years, amen. People say, I want you to pray for me, Brother Randy. Uh, I got problems in my church. I say, you got any people there? They said, yeah. I said, that's why you got problems, amen. If you've got people, you're going to have some problems, and that's just the way that it's going to be. And we need help in this church. We need help in our lives. And listen, there's nothing wrong with saying, God, I need you to help me. I need your help. Listen, I thought about the church in Ephesus, probably the deepest church theologically, in the New Testament, they had problems with anger and bitterness. Uh, the church in Philippi had problems with selfishness and anxiety. The church in Rome had problems. All those churches in the Word of God, it wasn't just the Corinthian church uh, that had issues. Every one of those churches had problems. And aren't you glad that God put it in the Bible? That's why we know that God wrote the Bible and man could not write the Bible if he would and would not write the Bible if he could uh, because man would cover all that up and man would 
would make it like it never did have no problems. God tells the truth on individuals. Do you realize we would not have this psalm tonight had David not found himself being overwhelmed? I got news for you. God sees on down the road in your life. You may be overwhelmed tonight, but God's got something planned for you if you'll just trust him and let him do a work in your life. And I'm glad God tells the truth on the saints of God in the word of God. You know, David said this, I waited patiently on the Lord. He inclined unto me, heard my cry, lifted me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock. He said, put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. He's established my going. Do you know that psalm before it's over with? David said, but I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh on me. I'm talking about a man that at one time he's up on the mountaintop and a few verses later, he said, I'm poor and I'm empty as a beggar. I'll say this, there's going to find, I mean, listen, you talk about uh, but being uh, God's will or being crazy, uh, about taking Brother Allen, listen, or going behind, you don't take nobody's spot like that and you don't feel it's you. I, I think I probably am half crazy, amen. I mean, you just about have to be. I don't want to do something like that. But aren't you glad God puts it in the Bible even sometimes when the greatest of people are spiritual basket cases? That's what David, he's, a, hey, he's on the mountain. Remember when God picked him up, set him on a solid rock, and before it's over with, he said, God, I'm empty as a beggar. And listen, that's why God gave us the word of God. He said, I found his way that way in Psalm 73 and verse two. He said, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps were well and I slipped. He went down to the house of God and he got some help. I'll say God's got some help for you tonight if you'll just let him do something in your life. You say, I'm overwhelmed. Well, you can't overcome an overwhelmed heart. Look at this. This is not real deep, but I want you to look what he did. The Bible said, Hear my cry, O God, and attend unto my prayer. And then he said, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. He responded with supplication. Now we know this. I know y'all know your Bible, but there's a threefold aspect to prayer. You've got prayer, which is adoration. You've got thanksgiving, which is appreciation. And then you've got what David's doing, and that's supplication. That's getting rid of all the formalities. And listen, whoever's prayed tonight, I, I, I appreciate public prayer, and, but you know you don't, play, you don't pray out in public like you pray when you're by yourself. I mean, listen, when you're overwhelmed and all, all you can get out is, oh... All you can get out is, oh God, I don't know what's going on. Lord, why is this happening to me? That's where David is finding himself. But aren't you glad tonight there is no spot too dreary. There is no mountain too high. There is no valley too deep. There is no condition too sorrowful. Uh, listen, whether it's a world's end or a life end, uh, that the prayer is not available. And sometimes you got to do like David. He said, hear my cry, oh God, and attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. His will got involved. He said, God, the adversary is taking me down. My mind, the world, the flesh, and the pressure is taking me down. He said, but God, I am coming to you in prayer. And Lord, I am casting myself at your mercy. Now here is David. He's not really where he wants to be. He's been cast out. He's not able to go to the house of God. He's not able to go down and worship in the sanctuary. And y'all know this, according to the Old Testament saints, I mean, listen, they looked as the temple as their center of affection everything to the Old Testament saint revolved around the house of God it ought to be that way today Amen. We ought to do. We ought to make our plans involving the house of God, involving the church. There's some things you're going to get the house of God you won't get anywhere else. But I do know some people, they'd love to be able to come to the house of God, but they're just not able to do so. Maybe it's health. Uh, maybe they're in a, a nursing home somewhere. Maybe they're just not able to get down to the house of God. You might find yourself in that way. Uh, listen, give anything to be in church. Give anything to be around the house of God. But I can say this, you might not be able to get to the house of God like you'd like to. And David no doubt would love to go down to the sanctuary. He said, God, I can't go down to the sanctuary of God, but I can go to the God of the sanctuary. And he said this, I'm gonna cry unto you. And he said, from the end of the earth will I cry. Hey, there ain't no place closer to heaven than the end of the earth. 
I mean, listen, I thought about that. That's not good English. And y'all mark that out. If the English teacher's in here, I'll probably say ain't got no for it's over with. So you can edit that. But listen, he finds himself at the end of the earth. And that's when he begins to cry out to God. What God is doing is getting us to a place where all the attaboy buttons are gone. All the pants of the back are gone. I mean, listen, all the pants, all the, I mean, listen, sometimes we'll dislocate our shoulder, uh, patting ourselves on the back. Honey, when you find yourself where David finds himself overwhelmed and listen he's finding himself in a place where you're going to find yourself sometime someplace somewhere he cries out to the Lord and listen uh, people say well you know I'd be glad new Christians get out of here well they're going to get their wish one of these days because we're, we're checking out but until then God has given you and I the greatest privilege and that is to talk to the Lord he said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And listen, you, you know, notice his prayer. He, he didn't say, God, get me out of it. He said, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed. Not if it's overwhelmed. He said, when it is overwhelmed. I remember I I'd first got to, when I first got saved. I mean, you know how it is. I didn't think I was ever going to sin again. I really didn't. I didn't. I found out about two hours later when I went into work. That wasn't the truth. There was a fella in there. I mean, listen, uh, he made me say something I didn't mean to say. And I said, see there what you made me do? I mean, listen, I, I thought, well, I ain't never got no problems again. And I found out, you know, that things are not going to go as planned. And, uh, but I, I had an issue with that. And I remember one, one night or one day the, uh, the youth choir was up there singing. And I was in there I, back when I was a youth. <laughs> yeah, that's been a long time ago, amen. That's why I got these specs right here. I just turned 50 years old. Y'all didn't believe that. Y'all thought I was 18. But I, I was there, and uh, I, they, we're singing in the choir, and I looked out across the congregation, and uh, hey, listen, you can't tell where somebody is by looking at their face. I've heard a lot of preachers, they'll get up and just blow somebody out and come to find out they got a kidney stone, a size seven kidney stone, and they're at the house of God just battling it out, trying to get something from God drawn up, and there the preacher blows them out because they say, I know you don't like this kind of preaching. I thought, sir, they, he, she's got a kidney stone. Praise God, I'm, if I had a kidney stone, I'd be at the house. Hey, man, that's exactly right. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've had a four and a five at the same time. Have yeah, mercy. Amen. But here David, he don't try to get out of it. I don't know, but I don't like storms. I don't like troubles. I don't like trials. Yeah, Paul, the apostle Paul, he besought the Lord three times. I think about this, Brother Coldfield. Only three times? Only three times? He said, thrice I besought the Lord about this. And we don't know exactly what it is. And Paul said, God, take it off of me. I can't handle it. God, take it off of me. I can't handle it. Third time, God, get it off of me. I can't handle it. And he said, Paul, my grace is going to be sufficient for you. Listen, God sometimes will allow things to come in our life. And you know what we want to do? We want out of it immediately. The Bible said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. That means when if, you, if you're a child of God, you mark her down, there is nothing that happens to you by accident. That individual that pulled out in front of you on the way to church, that wasn't for them, that was for you. I mean, listen, you had to get right with God. I tell you what, they squirrels in them holes, amen. I mean, listen, you're gonna have to get right with God before you can go any further. You know what God did? God allowed that by his sovereignty. And don't be afraid of that, amen. I believe God loves everybody and died for everybody. But listen, if you're saved by the grace of God, God, listen, was doing a work in David's life. He's God's man. Hey, if you're saved by the grace of God, God is doing a work in your life. The hardest thing to do is to allow him to do that work. We want out of it. We don't want to go through it. But here's what God is doing. He said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now listen, when the waves begin to come over us and wave after wave begin to wash you over, 
Uh, listen, God is doing a work in your life. He's not left you alone. You're saying, Brother Randy, I am overwhelmed. You might be overwhelmed by the circumstances, but the Christ can overcome anything you've got going on in your life. Hey, you put him on the rough waters, he'll just walk on them. You put him on your storm, he'll walk above it. You put him in your fire, he'll walk around in it. You put him in the dark place, praise God, he'll walk out of it, amen. There's not enough darkness to put out of the light. He said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He didn't say, lead me to a rock. He said, lead me to the rock. There's a movement today that said, well, you know, we need to be more open-minded. There's a church going down toward the house there, and that's what they call it, a church. Man, and uh, it's a church that's right there in the, in the Snorval area. And I passed the sign one day, and it said, open minds, open hearts, open doors. And I thought... Oh my goodness. I mean, and listen, I, we, we open the house of God to anybody. We want anybody and everybody to come. But I, I tell you what, this mindset of just let anything go and, and it don't matter what you call it. It don't matter if you call him Jesus. It don't matter what you call it. Hey, it does matter. Hey, there's some things that are non-negotiable in this Bible, amen. There's some things we ought to be dogmatic about. And there's only one rock, and the Bible said that rock was Christ. He said, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There was only one rock that could help you, and there's only one rock that could help David. There's only one rock that could help me when we find ourselves overwhelmed, and that is the rock. The Bible said, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, the storms of life have not wanting, have not knocked one piece out of place out of the rock. You say, Brother Randy, what kind of insurance you got? I got a piece of the rock, amen. And I'm telling you, like a good neighbor, Jesus is there. He'll always be there and he'll always be with you. I thought about in the book of Exodus in chapter number 33. Uh, listen, John, uh, uh, God goes to Moses and Moses said, God, show me thy glory. And listen, the Bible said this in in uh, Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 20. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by. I will put thee in the cleft of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand. Listen, God said, Moses, I'm going to put you in the rock. He said, There's a place by me. You know what God's doing in your life? And you don't realize that you're overwhelmed. What the Lord is doing is he is bringing you to a place where you can be by him. Amen. Everything that comes and happens in our life. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm getting, you say, what are you doing? I'm getting a breath. <laughs> and I'm drinking from a new fountain. Amen. Francis Toplady, he was, he was driving in a storm one day. This is back, back in the horse and buggy days. Brother Killian, you, you remember? Back in the horse and buggy days. And uh, the lightning was flashing and the fierce winds was coming against him. And he saw this hill and inside of that hill there was a cleft in the rock big enough for he and his horse and buggy to get in. And as he found that shelter from the storm, he sat there in that horse and buggy and he began to think of the thought, that's just like Jesus. And later he would compose the song, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Do you know what the Lord's doing? The Lord's doing something in our life. We don't even realize it. We can't understand it. But what he's wanting to do, you know what he said? He didn't say, show me to the rock. He didn't say, point me to the rock. He said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Young man in this blue shirt, will you trust me enough to come with me? You will, you will not regret it, I promise you. If you'll come with me, you will not regret it. This will be the best time that you've ever had in church. I promise you. Promise you. I promise you. I'm Brother Randy. You ever met me? Do you know who I am? Okay, I'm Brother Randy. So we just met. What's your name? Lucas. Lucas. What about that, Lucas? Lucas, when I got here, I saw you. When I went through the hallway again, I saw you. You know, Lucas, I got something, and I picked it out for you. If you'll go with me, and you'll trust me. See, Lucas, 
Now listen, there ain't no plan B in this. So when, he, when I thought he's going back out, I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> Lucas, I picked you out when I got here. I picked you out. I said, I'm going to be a blessing to him. He don't know it. And I didn't know, I didn't know who he was. So I just met Lucas, but he trusts me enough to let me lead him. You know what God wants us to do? God wants us to trust, uh, trust him enough just to let him lead. We don't understand it. Sometimes we get leery. Sometimes, Lucas, I'm glad that you're staying in step with me. A lot of times what we do is we put on the brakes and, honey, we'll dig in because we don't want God to go that way. Well, listen, we want God to take us up in the glory cloud. We want God to get us in the glory. We want God to manifest, but we don't want to go down there to the hospital. We don't want to go down there to the funeral home. We don't want to get the bad news. We don't want to get tore up about something that happened, Lucas. You're staying right in here with me. And you know what God's doing in everybody's life? If you're saved by the grace of God, God is doing something in your life even though you're overwhelmed tonight. What God is doing is God is bringing you to a door and you don't know it, but what God's going to do is God's going to open you a door that no man can shut. And behind that door, He's going to have some stuff for you that you don't even realize. Hey, listen, Lucas, I'm going to go ahead and give you this because it's hanging out the top of the bag, all right? Let me give you that. i tell you what God will do. If you'll just hold this hand and you'll just let him lead you, I show him, Lucas, what you got right there. Show it to him, what you got in your hand. If you'll just let God, if you'll let God lead you, if you'll let God guide you, you'll have some artillery to fight the enemy with Amen. that you never had and you still wouldn't had it had you not. Now listen, the bag is included, Lucas. The bag is included in this deal. If you'll just let God lead you, He will give you some artillery or you can fight the enemy with that you'll never have. If you'll let God lead you, I'll tell you what He'll do. He'll take you where the water's at. He'll take you where the refreshment's at and it'll be good for you and it will quench your thirst. i tell you something else you can do. Uh, maybe you might not be measuring up right now, but i tell you what God will do. God will take you up on a mountain. If you'll let Him lead you, you'll measure up the next time and be a blessing. i tell you what He'll do. Praise God. You let God lead you up to the mountain and the rocks higher than you are, you'll find out and you can have a ball serving the Lord. I tell you what, something else God will do. God will have you and God will have you. Listen, this is all yours. Bag, everything. You get it all. You get it all. You followed me. That's what God's doing. He's wanting to give you all. He's wanting to give you everything. No good thing is he's going to withhold you. I tell you what happened. I got to turn loose your hand, but I'm still with you. Ain't that the way the Lord is? I tell you what, God's got something for you. He's got something for you now, and he's got something for you later. Amen? And you know what I like about this? It says long lasting original. Honey, God's got something for you, and it's just for you. It ain't for nobody else before the foundation of the world. God had something for you. Do you know what he'll do? He'll give you a light to help you. He'll give you direction. Amen. Hey, listen, come on now. He'll give you light to help you. He'll give you direction. He'll give you something that, listen, there you go. Praise God. Amen. Batteries included. Batteries included. God will give you a light in the dark world. All right. Amen. You get to keep that light, okay? i tell you something else he'll do. Uh, you, you, never, you ever had any of them right there? I didn't think so. You know what God will do sometimes? You know why I put this in the bag? Because I like them. I put them in the bag because I like them. I tell you, God's got something for you, and he likes it. You don't even know if you'll like it or not. He'll put something on the top of the mountain for you. You'll like it when you get done. You'll like him right there. I'll give you money back guarantee on that deal, okay? Hey, praise God, you get to keep on that. I tell you what God will do. You say, Brother Randy, you saved? Yeah, I got saved 20 years ago. But he's still saving me. He'll be a lifesaver, amen, in this life. I'm talking about after you get born again. You know how many flavors is in that box? Five. Amen. He's got enough grace to help you in this life. He's got enough grace to save you. He's got enough grace to satisfy you. He's got enough grace to lead you. All this is yours. All this is yours right here. Every bit of it's yours. I tell you what God will do. God will take you to a place and it'll be good. And there'll be plenty of it. Amen. Hey, listen, you ain't going to tap God's resources out. I mean, listen, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the cows on the taters and taters and maters. Y'all have heard all them preachers say that. I got that wrong. I'll tell you what else he'll do. He'll give you something you can go to work with, amen. He'll give you something that you can work for him and his honor, his glory. 
I'll tell you something else. He'll give you a little honey. He'll give you a little bit of honey <laughs> for the journey. Amen. Something else he'll do. I mean, listen, now I'm waiting. I'll tell you what, here, here's some M&Ms. It's the master's motive <laughs> to take you to higher ground. That's why God's allowed you to get overwhelmed. God's taking you somewhere. God's doing a work in your life. You don't even realize it. Buddy, you say, what you going to hold back from you? Nothing. Zero. There ain't no such thing. There ain't no nothing, Barb, but there is a zero. All right. Man, tell you something else you do. You say, Brother Randy, what did I do? Well, I just hold on. One of these days, you're going to split the Milky Way. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> You say, will it be worth it? Oh, yeah. There'll be a payday someday. <laughs> Amen. If we'll just let him lead us to the rock. Amen. You can gather all that up when service is done. That's yours because you let me lead you. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciate it. What God wants us to do is to be leadable. See, we're really not going to be blessable until we become leadable. Now listen, some of y'all has gone through troubles and trials and struggles. It's made you what you are. God's doing something in your life. God's doing something in my life. And I, I hasten, uh, it, I don't even know if, I, mean, I didn't know if I was going to tell this or not. This just kind of come in my mind. I guess probably at the end of May. Glory to God, that's good. At the end of May, I had preached a meeting up in, uh, up in Maryland. And uh, I come home, and uh, when I pulled up in the yard, I, it's just, you know, I had everybody with me, my family, and we'd got back in. And I pull in, and it was, it, I'm, I was glad to be home. And I pulled up. My dad come riding out there in the four-wheeler. And I said, uh, I said, Daddy, I said, where's my truck at? And he said, uh, I don't know. And I seen the look on his face. And I said, ha, ah, somebody's. Played a trick on me. Now listen, I'm not talking about, and I'm not bad-mouthing any other truck. I'm talking about a 99 Ford F-350 four-wheel drive, dually, spray bed liner, b and ball, leather interior, 7.3 with 150,000 miles on it, 99 model in immaculate condition. All right, I'm not talking about just some truck. I sure enough, well, I, 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 I would badmouth Chevrolet, but you'll find out when I, why I don't after this story's over with. I said, Daddy, where's my truck at? He said, I don't know. I said, somebody's played an evil, wicked, ungodly, dastardly trick on me and hid my truck. Oh, no. No, they didn't hide my truck. Somebody stole my truck out of my yard. I mean, listen, we live out in the country. Never had anything like that. We used to leave our doors unlocked, amen? And now we're protected. I've, I went out and bought cameras and Smith and Wessons. And I already had, already had the Smith and Wesson part. You say, Brother Randy, don't you trust God? Oh, yeah, I do. I do. I just don't trust them other scoundrels out there, amen? So my truck's gone. I called the deputy. This is the Friday before Memorial Day. I called the sheriff's department. They come out there. And the deputy, he didn't mean to, did best he could. I gave him the VIN number. One day goes by, I call the insurance company, tell them what happened. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday's Memorial Day. Nobody's working Memorial Day. I got a buddy of mine who works for the sheriff's department. I called him, I said, Eddie, I said, uh, I've, somebody stole my truck. I said, well, you check on that. I said, my insurance company keeps telling me I'm not on that NCIB list or whatever, whatever that in, whatever that is, uh, where they've stolen. Some of y'all law enforcement people know what I'm talking about. It's the list of where that thing's been stolen, and it goes from from Dan to Beersheba, letting all the enforcement officers know <laughs> that this truck's stolen. Well, what happened? The deputy transposed the uh, VIN numbers, so for four days that truck's missing. And nobody even has it uh, hiding their hair where it's at, and it's not even on the list to be looking for. Well, it goes by, and you know, if you ever had anything stolen, you just feel violated. I mean, you just feel awful. Here's the deal there's a man at my house that morning working on my plumbing, and I know he didn't steal it. 
There's a man working at my house. I said, did you see my, did you see my truck here? He said, oh yeah, I seen it. I covered it after. That's what he said. He said, it was there that morning. I had some metal delivered that day at about 11.45. Come to find out, my daddy went out there to meet the guy delivering the metal. I said, Daddy, was it here at 11.45? He said, no, son, it wasn't here. My neighbors said, Randy, we seen you Friday. I said, you didn't see me Friday. They said, well, said we seen you and somebody in your truck. They drove by and he said, me and Darcy standing out there in the yard just waving, waving, waving. I said, what time was it? He said, about dinner time Friday. Now listen, my daddy, bar- my daddy's 70 something years old. My daddy barely missed them. You see what I mean? I don't know what would happen. God protected him, okay? Well, I, I, and I mean, I'm tore up. And I, I know this is not major to some. You're going through a whole lot more major things. But to me, I never had anything like that done. Well, it was going on and, and you know, and then... You start telling somebody in an insurance, in an office somewhere, a 99 model, how valuable it is. Well, sir, this thing is Kelly Blue Buck on it. Just give it. And I'm like, man, you can't go by that. This is a 7.3. I mean, this ain't just something. This is a 7.3, ma'am, with 150,000 miles on it. I mean, people will people catch you over this truck. Amen. So we went back and forth. And I mean, it brought stress and pressure and all that. And I'm going back across. Well, finally, okay, finally, they settled with me. And now I don't have a truck. And tore all to pieces. And they give me a settlement. I said, well, you know, what in the world am I going to do? I'm glad I got this money, but nothing's going to replace it. But then I got to think, you know what? It's just a truck. It's a truck. It don't have a soul. It don't have a heart. It's a piece of metal. <laughs> I had to bring myself to that point. Amen. Took a lot of work, a lot of grace. So here's my truck gone. Here's my truck gone. We got the excursion. Had 495,000 miles on it. I didn't, I didn't announce it. Didn't, wouldn't do anything. I wasn't sounding the trumpet from the housetop. But somebody overheard. They said, how many miles the excursion got on you? Got on it. And I said, about 495, something like that. And they said, man, alive. That's all it was said. 495,000 on the excursion. My truck stolen. I guess probably uh, three weeks ago, there's a pastor call. I said, Brother Randy, so there's a family in the church heard about your truck getting stolen. Heard how many miles that you got on your excursion. He said, they want to buy you a car. And uh, I said, what is it? And they said, well, they found you a Chevrolet Suburban. And I was like, <laughs> uh, I said, I said, really? I said, yes. Yeah. Said, now listen. Said they uh, said God's God's directed their heart. Said they want to buy you. They they heard about your vehicle. Heard about your truck getting stolen. They said they want to buy you a. Uh, they want to want to get you a vehicle. I said, what is it? They said it's a Chevrolet Suburban, pearl white, leather interior, captain's chair. Blah blah blah, etc. and so on. DVDs in the back. Listen, I'm I didn't I didn't ask for anything like that. Didn't know it was coming. Totally unexpected. You can see it. It's parked out there in the parking lot. They said we want to give it to you because we heard about what happened to your truck, and we heard what happened to you. I said that to say this: my truck is gone. No, 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 no. It don't end. It don't end there. They called me the other day and said, uh, Mr. Southern, this is so-and-so from the Sheriff's Department. We found your truck. We found your truck. I said, really? I was expecting, tore all to pieces. They said, it's at the Canaan Land Baptist Church parking lot <laughs> on, Cal- on Calhoun Avenue, not, 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 not Isaac John's, Canaan, or Danny Jenkins' Canaan Land. He said, it's Canaan Land Baptist Church in Rome, Georgia, on Calhoun Avenue. Now you think about that. Coincidence? I think not. I got over there and I expected to be tore all to pieces. Now, whoever it was, they had a good time in it. They tore off the back fender. That was what was tore off. The insurance company said, do you want to buy it back? I said, well, I don't know if I want it or not. He said, probably not. He said, when these kind of things happen, they usually just mess everything up. They'll pour something in there to mess up the motor. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I got a locksmith down there. He made the key. I stuck the key in, cranked the truck, and drove it home. I got the insurance money. Now listen, if it gets out, this insurance company is going to think I set all this up. And I did not. I did not do this. They paid me for my truck. They let me buy it back for not a whole lot. Let me buy it back, and I've done sold it to another guy. None of those things would have happened. And what I thought was going to be the worst thing, never had anything like that happen to me at all. What I thought was the worst thing turned out to be something that was a blessing. Now, I know that's a carnal illustration. And I know that that is something that is not really a big deal. It's just a vehicle, like I said. But what meant more to me than anything else is that was God was mindful of me. God was mindful of my family. God was mindful as to what was going on. And listen, I began to ask why. Why, God? I was out preaching a meeting when my truck got stolen. I mean, I wasn't outside something, you know, I wasn't out there and got out of church or whatever. I was preaching a meeting and my truck got stolen. Now I can stand here and look back and say, God knew what he was doing the whole time and I would not have what I have today without that. What God is doing in your life and in our lives, you wouldn't have what you have today because you wouldn't be... Listen, there is no way, Brother Cofield, I know me and I don't like me. I appreciate all the kind things you said. I don't like me. Because a lot of times it's me. I and me and what I want. There's no way I could have been able to receive that gift. And it really not bothered me. But now when I get in there, I'm reminded, hey, somebody come on my property, stole my truck, took that from me. But God allowed that to happen because he was going to send a blessing later on. You're overwhelmed right now. You say, well, I don't know why in the world this has happened in my church. I don't know why in the world this has happened in my home. I don't know why in the world this has happened. There's a lot of things that should not have never happened in the Bible that were sin and that was bad. And God took those things and turned them into something that was good. God can take your overwhelmed experience and turn it to something that can make you an overcomer. You can't overcome an overwhelmed heart. Thank you, preacher.